But your name is still Call the sea to still The raging me to still Darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble.
I've seen miracles my mind can't comprehend There is beauty in what I can't understand Jesus, it's you Jesus, it's you And I believe the wonder world
All the miracles I've seen You're too good to not believe You're the wonder-working God And you heal because you love All the miracles we'll see You're too good to not believe You're too good to not believe You're too good to not believe After everything I've seen
us into freedom Anything can happen in this place Give us dreams and visions Let us see your kingdom speak on on being thankful in in tough times. And how many know that we are living in some of those days right now? Let me read you a scripture. It's Philippians 4, 4 through 8. It says, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. If you do this, you will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, let me say one more thing as I close this letter. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right. Think about things that are pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. What a way to wrap up Thanksgiving. I was thinking, I saw a can that said, warning, contents under pressure. And I thought, that's a warning label I could put on a lot of people I know right now. And uh, warning, contents under pressure. And uh, I don't think I've ever seen so many stressed out people as I have these past few uh, months and, and weeks. And I began thinking that there's something about that. There's a well-known stress scale that, that's called the Home Stress Scale, which lists the 100 most stressful uh, events you could have in life. And some of those things that are listed on that, on that stress scale are the death of a spouse, a divorce, the death of a loved one, and things like that. And on that scale, after much study, they've discovered that the single most stressful time of the year is between Thanksgiving and New Year's. This is the, the, we are living in the most stressful time of the year right now. And you start to worry about presents, you start to worry about parties, all the problems that, you're, that are going to come, you know, the gifts, the finances, uh, the relatives that you have to see, the ones you don't want to see, the ones you're going to have to see. And the stress level just goes up significantly during this time of the year. And someone said, this is the season to be uptight. And I thought, okay, well, that's one way of looking at it, the season to be uptight. 
I mean, are you really ready to face all the parking lots and the shopping malls and even that? You, with COVID, it kind of has knocked that down. And uh, I was uh, in Dallas a couple days ago, and I saw two people get in a fight over a parking spot. And I was one of them. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I thought it was rather humorous because they were really into it. And uh, both these cars were into it. They both got out of their cars and got into it. In the meantime... Two open spots opened closer to the mall. And I'm thinking if they'd not fought, they both could have got those better parking spots. But they were determined they were going to get into it. I thought, well, here's the joyous season that we live in, we live in right now. And um, so I want to ask you, when we just celebrated Thanksgiving, how do you be thankful in tough times? When the economy is not what you're kind of hoping for and things aren't quite going the way you want, in Philippians 4, Paul says in verse 4, may you always be joyful in your life in the Lord. Is that possible, to always be joyful in your life in the Lord? No matter what the circumstance. The answer is yes, it is. But how do you come to a point where you understand that? And the first Sunday of each month, we celebrate communion here, and, and we share in the Lord's Supper together. And one of the words, one of the Greek words is the, for the word Eucharist, or Eucharistos, which basically means I receive with Thanksgiving. And uh, so we are officially now into the holiday season. Things are now taking place. And before they do that, I'd like to share with you a strategy for surviving this seasonal stress. And kind of help you get through that. And I suggest that you kind of write these down, then put them on your refrigerator door, or I always say put them on your refrigerator door or in your Bible, whichever one you use the most. Stick it someplace where you're going to see it. And uh, maybe you can, these will kind of help you as you get through these next few weeks and before we get into 2022. In Philippians 4, 6, which I just read, I want to read it to you from the Amplified Version. It says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God will, which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Then down in verses 8 and 9, it says, Finally, whatever is true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable, think about such things and the God of peace will be with you. There's four things I think I can give you there that will kind of help you get through this season. Number one is this. Worry about nothing. You know, Pastor, that's easy. Worry about nothing. It says there in Philippians 4, 6, don't be anxious about anything. Do not fret or have any anxiety. How many know that's easier said than done? Yeah. And uh, don't worry about anything. You know, if it was that easy, I wouldn't be talking about it. And uh, the Smithsonian Institute magazine says that we are in the golden age of anxiety. In fact, it says that we not only have micro worries, which are our own personal worries, but we also now have macro worries. And those are worries of the world and what's taking place. How many of you know that a new variant of the COVID is, is out? And uh, so here we go with another, here we go again. In fact, whatever takes place in Europe... Basically, just wait three or four weeks. It takes place here in America. They're just ahead of us by about three or four weeks and whatever's going on over there. But it's no wonder people are uptight. It's no wonder people get, get upset. We get up in the morning to what? An alarm clock. It's not, a, it's not a comfort clock. It's an alarm clock you wake up to. That's a great way to start off your day, isn't it? And then what takes place? The first thing you do is you turn on Bad Morning America and you find out what's going on here in America and what's taking place. And all it's not enough that you have your own problems, but you've got Afghanistan, you've got Iraq, you've got Iran, you've got China, you've got COVID, you've got a half dozen other things going on. That's the way you start your day. And you sit down and you eat your Wheaties or whatever you have in the morning and you read the news on your iPad, which by the way, usually isn't good news. It's, if it's going to be news, it's got to be something alarming to kind of get you going. This is the way you kick off your day. Then you get in your car and on your way to your work, you listen to all talk radio and, uh, and you hear something else that just, they have to get you riled up and get you going some way or another. It's no wonder that you're stressed out by the time you get to work and your day hasn't even started yet at work and you're a little bit uptight. You need to worry about nothing. Now I'm going to help you narrow this down this morning because there's some facts about worry. Dr. Walter Calvert did a study. Here's what he discovered. You can write it down. 40% of your worries never happen. 40% of your worries never happen. So if you had a list of 10 worries right now, you can knock off four of them. Just simply take those away. They don't happen. Pick out four, throw them away. 30% of your worries concern the past. 
So, worry cannot change the past and worry cannot control the future. All worry does is mess up today. So you got 30% there and uh, you can't do anything about that. It's a done deal. It just messes you up right now. So you can't control the past. You can't control the future. 40% aren't even going to happen. So basically, 70% of your worries are worthless. Okay, because they deal with the past or they're never going to happen. Okay, 12% of your worry worries are needless health concerns. Like the hypochondriac who wrote down in his tombstone, I told you I was sick. You know, it's something like that. And uh, 10% of your worries are insignificant and petty issues. They simply aren't that important. And only 8% of your worries are actual legitimate concerns. 8%. So what I suggest is, is that you take that 8, 8% as a, is a, is you pick a time of the day to worry about your 8%, like between 4 and 4.15 today, I'm going to worry about these, you know, because there's just not that much there. And uh, you've pretty much knocked out everything there. So, uh, between, so if you have a little worry, it pops up. No, I've got to wait till 4 o'clock. And from 4 to 4.15, I'm going to worry about these things. And you have your good little worry session. Get it out of the way and then go on with life. Because basically, a lot of stuff you worry about simply doesn't take place. It's simply not going to happen. Pick that time of the day. Worry doesn't change. Worry is stewing without doing. That's basically what worry is. You're stewing about something without doing anything about it. And by the way, there is no such thing as a born worrier. Well, I was just born this way. No, you weren't. Worry is a learned, learned response. And um, you learn it from your parents. You learn it from your peers. You learn it from, your, from experiences. And that's the good news. Because if you can learn something, you can unlearn something. Amen? You can come to that point. So how do you unlearn it? Well, here's what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough troubles of its own. So he's saying here, don't open up your umbrella until it starts raining. That's the basic idea. Don't worry about tomorrow, because today is the tomorrow you worried about yesterday. Simply is not worth worrying about. So the key to reducing stress in your life is live one day at a time. Today's got enough stuff to handle. Live one day at a time. Don't worry about tomorrow. Just focus on today. Focus on today's issues and problems. Don't worry. It's interesting that when Paul wrote this, he was in prison. And he was in prison in Rome in a dungeon. He's saying, don't worry about anything. Now, here's what I've discovered, that whenever God tells us not to do something, he always gives us something to replace it. Don't do this. So whenever God says don't, he'll usually have a, of a do. And anytime he says eliminate this from your life, he adds something. And step two is what he asks you to do. You eliminate this, and here's what you do. Pray about everything. Worry about nothing. Pray about everything. Philippians 4, 6, and everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. You might say, well, pastor, I just don't have time to pray. Well, you know why? Because you're worrying too much. So take your worry time and make it prayer time. Stop worrying, start praying. Do something with it. If you prayed as much as you worried, you'd have a whole lot less to worry about. Does that make any sense? So you don't necessarily need to add time to your day to pray. You simply take the time you're worrying and you start praying. And you'll find that you have a lot of time to pray when you start laying off the worrying and realize what's taking place. And he says to pray about what? In everything. Not just some things, but everything you can pray about. Some people think that God only cares about um, religious things. God only cares about how many people I talk to about Christ or how many people I invite to church or my giving or my tithe. And guess what? God's interested in your car payments. God's interested in your post-nasal drip. If you have that, and, uh, or your psoriasis, God is interested in every detail of your life. The Phillips translation says, when you pray, tell God every detail. You might want to circle that, every detail of your life. 
So God is concerned about the big things. God is concerned about the small things. He knows every detail of your life. He has even the hairs of your head numbered. And for some of us, it's easier than others. He's got your, those numbered in. God made your thumbprint unique. He made your voice print unique. Uh, he made every snowflake unique. He has no problem handling the details of your life. He knows who you are. And there's nothing that you, you cannot pray about. And there's nothing off limits with God when it comes to prayer. That's what I love about this. It, it, if it's worth worrying about, it's worth praying about. Understand what God has because he wants to bless you. And it says, pray with petition. So what does petition mean? Well, petition basically means a, a specific, detailed, direct prayer. Don't just be um, vague when you pray. Well, God, just bless me. Well, what is a blessing? I mean, think about that for a moment. Can you define what a blessing is? A blessing, sometimes a problem is a blessing. Did you know that? Because it directs you to God. And uh, is that what you're praying for? God, give me more problems? I won't. No, we don't, you know, so be detailed when you pray. Say, God, give me a blessing. Well, you don't know what you're asking for. Because you might be in for a surprise. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about what happens to you. One translation puts it this way, unload all your worries on him since he is looking after you. All your worries. You have to learn to unload our problems instead of worries, and prayer is a tremendous, I think, release valve when it comes to that. In fact, um, how do you handle the stress? You just turn it over to the Lord, you release it. There's a word, that word unload, by the way, is the idea that you just let it drop. You don't toss it, you don't carry it, you don't drag it over there. It's simply so heavy that you couldn't do it, so you just let it go. Lord, here it is, I don't know what to do with it. I don't know what to do with it. And God says that when you do that, when you dump those on him, he takes care of that. Unload them on God. I read once that a, that, that a major life insurance company has done a study, and they discovered that if you go to church every week, you will live 5.7 years longer than the person who doesn't go to church. So for all of you who are listening right now who didn't come here, your lifespan is shortening. And uh, we're going to live longer than you. And, uh, and I thought, well, why would it be that people who attend church live longer? And I think one of the reasons it might be is, is that we know that here we can unload on the Lord. How many of you ever brought something to God and you unloaded it? You couldn't handle any more. You said, I can't carry it any farther. And here's the deal. If you don't talk it out to God, you'll take it out on yourself or somebody else. And um, when you swallow your worries, your, your stomach keeps score. How many of you have ever had an upset stomach because... You know, you're so worried about something. So you have to unload it. First Peter 5, 7, Philip's translation says, you can throw the whole weight of your anxieties upon him for you are his personal concern. Man, I like that. James 4, 2 says, you do not have because you do not ask God. Just ask God to help you with your worries and your problems. Here's the insight. And that is, no problem is too big or too small to pray about. I used to think, well, this problem, God doesn't care about that. He cares about every problem you've got. Doesn't matter what size it is. Paul says, if you want to relieve stress, here's what you do. Worry about nothing. Pray about everything. Simply put, it means something you have to, it's something that you have to learn over and over again. So what's number three? Third step is thank God in all things. Now, how many of y'all discovered that is tough? Thank God in all things. Philippians 4, 6, he says, when you pray, pray with thanksgiving. The good news is, is always ask him with a thankful heart. So whenever you pray, you, you should always pray with thanksgiving. And I've shared this with you before, that, that the healthiest human, I think, emotion is, is not probably love, but it's gratitude. There's something about gratitude. It actually increases your immunities. They say that gratitude makes you more resistant to stress. It, uh, it's less susceptible to illness. I was in a hotel, uh, a cheap hotel in Dallas, really cheap hotel. And uh, I mean, really cheap. And I got there in a car, the guy next to me got there in a bicycle. And, uh, 
And every hour at night, he would come out of his room yelling at the top of his lungs, F this and F that and uh, and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that and just screaming up a storm and I, I kept trying to look through the ear, the ear hole, the eye hole, eye deal, but it was such a bad hotel, it wasn't clear, I couldn't see what was out there and I wasn't about to look through the window because I thought if I do, he'll probably be staring right at me and I would be scared and I'd probably scare him. <clears throat> but this went on every night of almost every other hour. And I finally told, the second night I finally told the people at the hotel, I said, you know, I got a guy next to me who, I don't think he's all, I don't know what's going on. But he's really upset with somebody and he's upset with the same person every night, but he's not talking to, there's nobody out there but him. And I didn't want to report him because I was in my mother-in-law's car and I was afraid that he would scratch my car or something. And I thought if I report him, you know, what am I going to do? So I thought, you know what I can do? I can pray for him. So every night, the more he yelled, the more I prayed. And you know what happened the last night? He was still there when I left. The last night, there was no yelling going on. He must have slept through the entire night. I don't know. I know one thing. I wasn't going to go out there and talk to him. I may be dumb, but I'm not stupid. And, uh, but I can thank God in all things. I thought, pray with thanksgiving. I thought, Lord, you put me here for a reason. Apparently, you put him there for a reason. So, Lord, speak to him somehow. Do something in his life and, uh, and protect me while you're at it. Thank you, Lord. And uh, thank God in all things. The attitude of gratitude. I think people who are ungrateful uh, are people who are miserable. People who are grateful are, are happy. Cultivate the attitude of gratitude, being thankful in everything. There used to be an old song that says, count your blessings and name them one by one. How many of you know that song? Yeah. How many of y'all know that song more than the songs we sang this morning? <laughs> That's an age group thing. I could probably sing, count your blessings, y'all would just bring right in with me. Except for some of you who are raised Catholic who have no clue what that song's about. And, uh, but it's talking, you know, make a list of the, of the blessings that God has done in your life. Realize what's taking place. I sat down this past week and I made a list of what I was grateful for. My family, my friends, my, the protection that God puts upon me. Uh, we were on our way down to Texas on Sunday after night. And on the way down there, I was going about 75, 80 miles an hour on the Oklahoma Indian Turnpike. When lo and behold, a deer decided to jump in front of me. And uh, of course, I hit the deer. And, uh, and he went sailing over our car. And after the airbags went off and everything, we came to a screeching halt. I got out of the car as best as I could. My door went hardly open. And I crawled out and looked at the car and thought, well, this is a mess. Where's the deer? I wanted to go over and kick it a couple times, but that wasn't going to happen. And uh, I decided I'd try and turn the car back on. The car started back up. Paul and I both sat there and said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for protecting our life. We're in the middle of nowhere, pitch dark. It's about eight o'clock at night. I have no idea what we're going to do. And I said, I said, let's see if it'll, if, it'll, if it'll go. And we started going 20 miles an hour, 30, 40, 50. I was up to 60. This is pretty good. The car's not overheating. We drove an hour, stopped at a gas station. And when I pulled into the gas station, I'm here. I'm here in a whole mess underneath my car. And we pull it in. I'm going to put some gas in the car because I want to make sure I make the next stop. Is I want to make it all the way to her mom's house. That's my goal with one headlight working. And um, we get out. I'm dragging all kind of stuff underneath the car. And I thought, Lord, you're going to have to help me here. I don't know what to do. And immediately, six people walk up to us. Hey, can we help you? Everything okay? The women are hugging Paula. Are you all right? And... Uh, and they're giving her hugs, and I'm thinking, this is Oklahoma. And, uh, and, uh, and this one guy, we get talking, and they says, I said, well, I got to get all this stuff. They, said, we'll get, they, they, they crawl underneath my car. They're ripping stuff off. I got parts of my car all put in the back seat and in the trunk. And uh, I says, well, that fender's going to be a problem because it's scraping the tire. Oh, no problem. We got some bungee cords. They, got, they bungee cord my car up. I had bungee cords going all different directions. And uh, as long as I didn't turn real sharp, I was good to go. 
I thought, I could make another hour and a half. And then he said, the guy, one guy, I said, where are you from? He goes, I'm from Brazil. I said, oh, he said, my wife's from Colombia. So immediately I began talking to her in Spanish, and we talked for a while, and he says, well, he says, um, is there anything else? I said, well, what do I owe you? He said, oh, nothing. We were just glad we could help you. So sorry you hit a deer in our state. I said, well, I am too. And uh, <laughs> he goes, can I pray with you? I said, Absolutely, as I'm a pastor. He goes, oh, I am too. <laughs> he goes, I pastor an Hispanic church here in Tyler. And uh, or a couple, we were away from Tyler, but that's where he was. I said, well, that, he says, you know, you can follow us if you want. You can stay at our house. I said, well, if I can follow you, I can probably make it to my mother-in-law's house. We'll just keep trying to go. So we prayed, hugged each other. I thought, Lord, you are so good. You are so good. We got all the way to down to Jefferson, as long as we didn't make sharp turns. And uh, I didn't want my wheels scraping. I, was, I called my insurance. They said, well, it's going to be three weeks at least before they can even do anything about it. Within three days, the car was already declared totaled. They said, don't worry about it. We'll take care of everything else. So I thought, well, now i got to get a rental car. My mother-in-law says, you know, I haven't driven my car since the last time you were here, so just take my car till you get something. So I'm driving a nice Lexus out there that I just soon buy from her, but she won't sell it to me. So uh, she's kind of nice, and sometimes she's mean. And uh, <laughs> she was a good mother-in-law. She just would have given me that car, but, you know, <laughs> she's not using it anyways. I hope she doesn't see this. <laughs> and uh, she'll be asking for that car back tomorrow. Long story short, hit a deer going 75 Paula had a slight bruise from the seat belts. I had a little scratch on my knee. Praise the Lord. Be thankful in all things. You might say, well, Pastor, your car was only a year old. Yeah. But I had good insurance. I had gap insurance also, so everything's covered. God is good. He is good. Man. 1 Thessalonians 5 8 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Circle that word in, because it doesn't say give thanks for every circumstance. And I've said it before, so I'm not going to go over a length. But give thanks in every circumstance. And um, you might say, Well, you know, you had a flat tire, give thanks. Well, you had a car wreck, praise the Lord. I'm not saying that you say praise the Lord for the car accident, but in every circumstance, you can find something to be thankful for. Something that God did through that, that you can give thanks. The Bible doesn't say to be thankful for evil. It says in every circumstance, give thanks. There's something that God does. What's the difference? Even, if, even out of the bad, God can bring good out of it. There's something that God can do. He has a bigger purpose and he has a bigger plan. I'm a firm believer in that. No matter what takes place, he gives me the, 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 the power to overcome the problem. And besides that, I grow through the experience if I allow him to teach me how to grow. I grow through it. You want to know what God's will for your life is? Some people say, well, I don't know what God's will for my life is. I'll tell you what it is right now. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will. Start right there. And you'll be amazed at what God will do in your life. In fact, if you're not experiencing the attitude of gratitude, you're probably out of God's will. Come to a point where you understand how to get there. There's so much you can be thankful for in your life. The problem, or the best thing I think to do is sometimes we look at what we've lost rather than what we have left. I've thought this whole week about what I lost. I lost a car that I was a year old. But Paul and I still have our health. We're not in a hospital. The deer doesn't have health. <laughs> That's its problem. But I have found that gratitude is a stress reliever. And uh, it gets your eyes off the problem. So what's the insight? The way we express thanks is by giving. And, um, and the most giving people are usually the most thankful people. There's something about that. So what's number four? And we'll wrap this up this morning. Number four is I think about the right things. Think about the right things. Finally, Philippians 4 8 says this Finally, brothers, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. 
Think about such things. If you want to reduce the level of stress in your life, change the way you think. Very simple. None of us use our brain to its full potential. And uh, so the potential that God has given us. So whatever you put in your brain usually is what's going to come out. Garbage in, garbage out, if, you, if that's what you feed it with. And um, whatever you feed your mind. So feed your mind on the word of God. And understand the fact that God has a purpose and God has a plan. And if you think about things that are true, noble, right, lovely, admirable, you fill your mind, you fix your mind on those things. It involves a, a, a deliberate, I think, conscious choice where you choose to think. And if you think about everything that's negative, you know what you become? A very negative person. If you focus on God's word, you know what you become? You begin to become God's word. You begin to live out the plan and the purposes that God has for your life. The root cause of stress, I think, is the way I choose to think. The way I choose to think. And why is it that you can take two people, put them in the same circumstance, one of them will get blown away, they fall apart, they collapse, they're, they become emotionally unavailable, and the other handles it with no problem, feathers unruffled. It's by the choice of what they think. You can say, oh God, I, I, you know, I had an accident, it's a total mess, my life is ruined, what am I going to do? Or you can say, thank you Jesus, I'm still here. And uh, Paul and I got out of the car, we walked around for a while, we checked our legs, shook ourselves. You know, when those airbags go off, they're pretty traumatic. That's, that's my first experience, deer and airbags. And uh, she goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to look through the windshield, through all the smoke. I thought the smoke came from my engine. I didn't realize it was from the airbags. And um, my key went from being straight to bent, just like almost sideways. I have a little thing in my pocket. It's a knife. It's this little thing right here. Isn't that little? And, uh, and it's a little knife. Well, when we got to my mother-in-law's house, this is the way it looked. This little top was, could not be found any place. I found it on Paula's side by the door. It came off when the deer hit us. When the deer hit us, it's the deer's fault. And, uh, and uh, that's a very Spanish statement right there. And um, I kept thinking, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody at the gas station kept saying, how in the world are you driving this thing? Uh, I don't know. As long as the cops don't pull me over, I'm going to go as far as I can. But it was, it was. It was a miracle that we were still able to drive and still able to get the car we were going. God is good. I mean, he really is. It's amazing what you, you know, the choice, the way you think about things makes such a difference in your life. In fact, Proverbs 3, or 23, 7 says, a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So you can always be thankful for something. What do you think about the most? What dominates your mind this morning? Whatever you think about the most is what you're becoming. We always move, to, move towards what we're focusing on. First thing I learned in, in riding a motorcycle was if there's a Something in the road, don't look at it. Because if you look at it, you drive, you pull, you just steer right towards it. That's what deer do. They see the headlights, oh, I want that. And, uh, but I learned real quick on a motorcycle, always look where you want to go, not what you're trying to avoid. If you look at what you're trying to avoid, somehow you'll run into it. So what do you choose to think about? What is the result of doing these things? Worrying about nothing, praying about everything, thanking God in all things, keeping my mind on the right things. What's the result? You can write it down. God's peace. That is the result. God's peace. Philippians 4, 7 says, if you do this, if you do this, you will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. His peace will keep your thoughts and your heart quiet and at rest as you trust in Christ Jesus. What a guarantee here. I mean, he is guaranteeing peace of mind. Have you noticed that that's what everybody's looking for? Peace of mind? It's amazing where people will go trying to find peace of mind. They run every place else and, but to the Lord. So how do I get that peace of mind that keeps my heart under under pressure where it should be, it's called a relationship with Jesus. It still comes back to that. A relationship with Jesus. His peace will keep your thoughts. 
His peace will keep your thoughts. You know, there's a, the, the word keep is a great military term. This is in, in verse 7. It means a sentry guard or a, a garrison or a troop of soldiers. When Paul was writing this to the people in Philippi, he was in a Roman city, a colony protected by a Roman legion. Uh, the sentry guards, they kept the peace of the city. God's word says that when I trust Christ, you know what he does? He puts a sentry guard around my mind. He, puts a, he keeps me at peace. When everything wants to stress me out, he keeps me at peace. And this week I got to live a little bit of that. And what's got you worried this morning? As we close, is it, is it your health, your finances, your relationships? Is it all the things you got to do the next couple of weeks with, the, with what's going on? Is it marriage? Is it your kids? Is it your career? I think if you take these steps, uh, let Jesus Christ become the center God of your mind. Center your life around him. You'll find a peace that you can't imagine. I want you to bow your heads with me just for a moment this morning. And to me, it's very personal. But if you can look at your life right now and you say, Pastor, you know what? I, I need his peace. Especially as we begin this, this time and this season. I need his peace in my life. Would you pray with me that God will give me that peace? I want you to raise your hand because I want to pray for you this morning. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes, yes. Anybody else this morning? I need his peace. Yes. I'm preparing to go into a time, and I mean, this is a stressful time. But I want to think on the right things. I want to make that conscious choice in my life. Anybody else before we pray this morning? Could you stand with me? Many of you raised your hands and you have family members next to you. And you might just want to join their hand this morning. Because lack of peace in a home affects the home. And, uh, but the peace that you bring in can also affect the home. How many of you have ever been in a situation where Somebody's walked into the room and immediately you have sensed peace. When Jesus walks into the room, there's peace. When Jesus lives in your life, you can walk into a stressful room and you can bring in peace. So that's what I'm praying for us as a church and as families that we'll be covered in God's peace. And this morning, it's not important that you know who raised their hands. For some of you, it's a very personal thing because you know, you only you know what you're going through. But you know you need his peace this morning. So would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you. Help me to worry about nothing. Help me to unload my worries, to cast my cares upon you. Dear Lord, I ask right now, help me to pray about everything the things that worry me. May I discuss them with you rather than worry about them. Lord, let me give you the details of what's taking place. And through all of that, help me to be more grateful. Dear Lord, I believe there are people here that are praying there. Help me to develop that attitude of gratitude to thank you in every situation. And to realize that there's always something more that you have for us. Dear Lord, for those who raised their hands this morning, help us to think about the right things. To spend time with you. Fill our mind, dear God, with the thoughts that you want us to think about. Not the negative garbage that's out in the world. I ask you right now, dear Lord, may you put your peace in the heart's of those that have raised their hands this morning. And dear Lord, if by chance they're here right now and they've never given their heart to you, may they take that first step and say, I turn the control of my life over to you this morning. Dear Lord, as we wrap up Thanksgiving week, may we truly wrap it up giving you thanks. 
saying, thank you, Jesus, for all you've done in my life. Through every situation, you're still there. You don't leave me. You don't abandon me. I can't outrun you trying to run away from you. You're always there. Dear Lord, we thank you. Could you just raise your hands right now and in your own words and say, Lord, I thank you. I thank you this morning for who you are. I thank you for what you do. I thank you in advance, dear God, for what you're going to be doing in my family. You might want to proclaim that this morning. For those who aren't walking the way they should, I thank you in advance, dear God, that, that you're going to speak to them through situations. You're going to speak to them through me. You're going to speak to them, dear God, in ways that, that only you can. Holy Spirit, just do your work in those around us and in us. And we say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Dear Lord, may you guide us. May you prepare us for this week. May you prepare divine appointments for us. And dear Lord, may we walk out the exact plan that you have, that you might be glorified. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. And everybody says, amen, amen. amen.